Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today we're pleased to speak to Sheikh Naved. How are you, Sheikh? Alhamdulillah, very good. Jazakallah khair for having me. Thank you so much. Jazakallah khair for being here. Sheikh Naved was born and raised in Montreal, Canada. He completed a degree in social sciences before heading to the Islamic University of Medina, where he completed a diploma in Arabic and a bachelor's in Sharia. Upon returning to Canada, Sheikh Naved started to teach with Al Maghrib Institute and has since transitioned to become their director of public relations. He also continues to serve as a director of education with the Islamic Information Society of Calgary, a role he has had since 2012. Today, Sheikh Naved is going to speak to us about prophetic emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is extremely essential in better enhancing our interactions with our friends and family and colleagues so that they lead to stronger relationships. But even more importantly, it's essential for giving effective da'wah. It's vital that we learn how to emulate the Prophet, peace be upon him, when it comes to managing not only our own emotions, but those of others as well. And inshallah ta'ala, we hope to benefit from the insights and concepts that will be shared by Sheikh Naved in his presentation to us. Sheikh Naved, whenever you're ready, you may begin. Jazakumullah khairan. Bismillah. I'll share my screen and let us begin. Bismillah ta'ala. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Allahumma la ilma lana illa ma'allamtana fa'allimna ma yanfa'na wa anfa'na bima'allamtana wa zidna ilma ya kareem. My dear brothers and sisters, um, to give you some background on this topic, you know, I, I was exposed to this topic for the first time by the book written by Sheikh Mikhail Smith called With the Heart in Mind. And it really opened my eyes um, as to the importance of this topic. So a lot of the information that you'll find in this presentation, its foundation is found in that book with my own research uh, that I did thereafter. And obviously, um, I'll share this on the resources page as well, but I would highly recommend our brothers and sisters to refer to that book with the heart and mind by Sheikh Mikhail Smith, and then also to the longer YouTube series that I've done over uh, four parts but approximately each session is about an hour and a half where we go into a lot more detail. So I'll, I'll, share, I'll share the required links in the description box below. Oh, perfect. Jazakum Allah khairan. So as uh, our brother Bassam mentioned, we want to start off with how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used emotional intelligence, but from the lens of da'wah. And obviously, if you can understand the lens of da'wah, you can apply it to pretty much uh, into every relationship of our lives, because the relationship of da'wah is so sensitive that perhaps it is the most sensitive relationship that you could have, because you're literally on the verge of, you know, with the tawfiq of Allah, sending someone to Jannah or, you know, um, they end up in Jahannam, subhanAllah. So that's how we, we want to frame it. So let us understand the burden that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had first. And this is from the verse in, in Surah An-Nisa, where Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala He tells us, فَكَيْفَ إِذَا جِئْنَا مِن كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ بِشَهِيدٍ وَجِئْنَا بِكَ عَلَى هَأُولَاءِ شَهِيدًا And how would it then be when we shall bring a witness from every community and shall bring you over them as a witness, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One of the narrations that speaks about this verse is that one of the companions saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam praying Qiyamul Layl and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam read this verse pretty much the whole entire night as tears were flowing down from his eyes and his beard became wet and you could start to see the forming of a puddle underneath at his feet due to how much you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam felt this burden that showing up on the Day of Judgment as the final and last messenger sent to all of humanity, right? There are no prophets and messengers coming after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he is carrying this burden for all of humanity till the Day of Judgment. So you can imagine how weighty this was on the shoulders of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is something that he carried with him at all times. In fact, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala he tells us in uh, Surah Al-Kahf that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was on the verge of, you know, severe emotional depression when people would not accept Islam, right? Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala tells us, فَلَعَلَّكَ بَاخِعُ النَّفْسَكَ عَلَىٰ آثَارِهِمْ إِلَّمْ يُؤْمِنُوا بِهَذَا الْحَدِيثِ أَسَفَةً That that is how severely impacted the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was, that it would 
cause severe emotional depression to him as people would turn away from Islam. And I think this is a beautiful point to, uh, to start off on that how much of that burden do we carry, right? As followers of the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as ambassadors of Islam, you know, how much do we carry that burden of Islam? And from two folds, number one, acknowledging the responsibility. And then number two, the desire of wanting dunyawi and ukhrawi success for all humanity, for all people that we interact with, right? So it's something that we constantly need to remind ourselves of that we have this burden of sharing Islam with us within our due capacities. You know, for some people, it will be active da'wah, but for the vast majority of us, at least through our character, at least through our interactions, at least through providing basic information as to why we do the things that we do and why we act the way that we act. Now we get into the topic of intelligence. And for the vast majority of time uh, through the science lens, you know, intelligence has only been measure measured through your intelligent quotient, right? Your IQ. And that has been like the, the standard for the vast majority of, of time. Now, there are now multiple theories that talk about, you know, multiple intelligence theories. So for example, you will have emotional intelligence, you'll have moral intelligence, uh, you'll have social intelligence, all of these different intelligences that exist. Now, from the lens of Islam, I think we can accept all of these. Like we're not there to, to reject um, you know, the, this theory, but we can accept it based upon the fact that when you look at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as someone that was unlettered, he didn't, you know, formally go to school. He didn't know math the way we know math. He didn't know language the way that we know language. Yet, if you were to measure his success by the amount of influence he's had in the shortest period of time, that's why he's constantly referred to the greatest leader that humanity has ever seen. His ability to have the greatest amount of impact in the shortest amount of time now, one of the theories that I'm presenting is that took place through a high level of emotional intelligence. And this is what Sheikh Mikhail Smith argues as well, that the Prophet wasallam perhaps had the highest level of emotional intelligence, and thus he was able to be this phenomenal leader, this phenomenal, you know, I, I, I dislike using the word because it's stigmatized in such a way, but influencer, right? Before a social media influencer existed, the Prophet wasallam you know, is the, the paragon of what positive influence actually looks like. And we have this quote by Wahab ibn Munabih that talks about his exposure to the different books and all the people that he's come across. And without a shadow of a doubt, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the most intelligent man that uh, he ever came across. And this is one of the great scholars uh, of hadith uh, mentioning this. So now, what does success actually look like from an emotional intelligence standpoint? Now, is with regards to providing an actual working definition, the simplest thing, thing that I can say about emotional intelligence, it is the recognition of your own emotional state as well as the emotional state of the individual or people that you're interacting with and using that knowledge to get to a particular point in the relationship. So from the lens of the Prophet wasallam, it's phenomenal that how many times in the seerah do we see, may my life be sacrificed for you, O Messenger of Allah. May my you know, parents be ransomed for you, O Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam reach that level? And we have a more specific example of Amr ibn al-As, when he asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, who is the most beloved person to you? Hoping and anticipating that it would be him because of the way the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made him feel in his presence. But he says that it is Aisha. Then he says, oh, not from the women folk of Messenger of Allah, but from amongst the men. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, her father. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam continues to mention, you know, the companions that we know, like Umar and like Uthman, and the narration continues. But the point we want to extrapolate from this is how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made people feel as if they were the most valuable people at that time in his life. And he cherished their company, he cherished their presence and made them feel valued. Now, a person may think, but isn't that very manipulative? And this is where we have to add this concept of moral intelligence into play as well. If the Prophet Wasallam did this for worldly benefit, did this for personal benefit, without a shadow of a doubt, this could become very, very manipulative. But time and time again, we see that the Prophet Wasallam only did this 
for the sake of the individual's dunyawi or ukhrawi benefit. And more than likely, almost always, there's a, a predominant ukhrawi benefit that the Prophet wasallam wanted this person to achieve. So he's using his emotional intelligence to help this person reach a state in their relationship where they will strive even harder to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, strive even harder to uh, long for Jannah. And that is how the Prophet wasallam used it. So when we're looking at what does success look like in the usage of emotional intelligence, it's when people feel valued, when people feel seen, when people feel heard, and when people feel loved in your presence. Now, this is just a general reminder that the default state of any relationship has to be based upon love, mercy, and compassion. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes one of the blessings bestowed upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيظَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْ فَضُّ مِنْ حَوْلِكَ That by an act of mercy from God, you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, were gentle in your dealings with them. Had you been harsh or hard-hearted, they would have dispersed and left you. And now I know this problem, or rather this question, will always come up. But were there not times that the Prophet ﷺ was harsh? And yes, without a shadow of a doubt, there were times that the Prophet ﷺ was harsh and the Prophet ﷺ did get angry. But what do we learn about the anger of the Prophet ﷺ? That it was always for the sake of Allah. It was never personal. So people could transgress against the Prophet ﷺ and he was forgiving and merciful and compassionate. But when it came to the violations against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and against the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is when the Prophet ﷺ did not compromise and expressed his anger. So the general default rule of engagement is love, mercy, and compassion. People transgress against you. Try your utmost best to be merciful and forgiving. And we'll talk about this in a bit more detail in, the, in one of the coming slides. But when it comes to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have to be open and clear that it's not for me to compromise on this. It's not for me to be soft on this. These are the boundaries that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set. And those boundaries cannot be transgressed. While keeping in mind, the default rule of engagement is love, mercy, and compassion. And this goes back to the previous point that when you want good for people, how many times has good been attained through constant anger and constant harshness? Anger and harshness are only powerful and effective when contrasted with love, mercy, and compassion. If a person is constantly angry and constantly harsh, the effect is completely lost at that time. So now... This is going to be the bulk of where the work takes place. And this is the framework that, you know, I, I think I've been working on for almost like three years now, subhanAllah. And every time I present this, every time I study it, I'm truly amazed how, you know, one ayah can bring uh, so much benefit. So these are the last uh, verses from uh, Surah at -Tawbah where we're just presenting one verse and it's amazing how it ties into the to the conclusion as well but let's just focus on this verse now where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says laqad ja'akum rasulun min anfusikum azizun alayhi ma'anitum harisun alaykum bil mu'minin ra'ufur rahim that a messenger has come to you from among yourselves your suffering distresses him most eager is he for your welfare and full of kindly, kindness and mercy towards the believers. So now when we look at this first part of the verse, لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِّنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ There has come to you a messenger from amongst yourselves. Oftentimes, when you look at the books of tafsir, you'll find that this is a messenger that speaks your language, he wears your clothes, he eats the food that you eat, he drinks the drinks that you drink, and he engages with you like as if he is one of your own. And this we see this time and time again, that a foreigner would come and they would be unable to recognize the Prophet ﷺ because how well immersed he was with his companions and his community, that he was one of them. But what we want to present over here is another lens to this that ties into the second part of the verse, that it severely pains him and distresses him, the suffering that you experience. So now going back to the first part of the verse, if you look at this from a seerah lens, the life of the Prophet ﷺ is filled with an immense amount of pain and hardship. 
From the time that he is born, his father passes away shortly. Thereafter, his mother passes away. He's in the care of his grandfather, and he too passes away. He eventually grows older, falls in love with Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. She too passes away. She bears from him six children, of which all of them pass away, with the exception of Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha. He's now in the protection of Abu Talib, and Abu Talib, his, you know, confidant and defender uh, in front of the Quraysh, he too passes away. He ends up going to Taif, seeking help from these people, bringing them benefit, wanting that, that which is best for them. But not only do they reject him and rebuke him, but they pelt him to the degree that he bleeds. Now the Prophet ﷺ arrives into Medina. He tries to establish a treaty with these people that they will all defend the land that they are living in. But those very tribes that are meant to be trustworthy and honest and caring for their own community and society end up becoming treacherous to the Prophet ﷺ. And through this time, he also experiences family problems where he's on the verge of divorce. So multiple things are happening. So now if you tie this into the second part of the lens, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that there's come a messenger to you from amongst yourselves, meaning that any possible aspect of pain that you will feel and could have felt the Prophet ﷺ has experienced it. And even though the Prophet ﷺ never used these words of been there, done that, the Prophet ﷺ consoled people with that you know, experience already present. That any form of pain they're going through, the Prophet ﷺ has already felt it. Now why is that relevant? Because the Prophet ﷺ knows the severity of that pain, but he also knows how to navigate through it from a lens of the deen, from a lens of your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oftentimes we're taught that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa experienced this pain to strengthen his tawakkul and his reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, that is true without a shadow of a doubt. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa also felt that pain so that he was able to empathize at a much deeper level with those people. So when a person says, you know, I've lost my father, the Prophet ﷺ says, don't worry, both of our fathers are in the hereafter, are in the hereafter, you know, in the, in the narration of Sahih Muslim, in the hellfire, right? So this level of empathy that he's able to develop and able to console people with that experience. So this is the first part of the ayah that we want to reframe, that it's not just about the physical state of the Prophet ﷺ, that he had immersed himself into the community, but basically any form of pain that they could have felt, the Prophet ﷺ has felt as well. And now when we get to the second part of this ayah that mentions Azizun alayhi ma'anitum, that it is severe upon him, the suffering that you experience. This goes back to the Prophet ﷺ detested the fact that people would have to experience hardship because of him. Right? The fact that they were embracing the deen of Muhammad ﷺ that they would experience this pain and hardship. The Prophet ﷺ didn't want that for them, but he recognized that that is where the success lies. And even though he recognized this, this didn't prevent him from empathizing. And this is something that's so important that sometimes people need to go through pain and they may, in our perspective, deserve it, but that shouldn't prevent us from empathizing with them. And that shouldn't prevent us from helping them navigate a way out by being connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So having this deep sense of empathy with people is so important. Now, from the lens of da'wah, you know, we say this all the time that there's a void in the hearts of people that cannot be filled except by the ibadah of Allah, except by the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, except by the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you're raised in Islam, we haven't experienced that, alhamdulillah. And that is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we may not be able to relate to it from a first-hand perspective. But if you look at the way non-Muslims talk about the pain and agony that they feel every single day in trying to figure out why they're on this planet, what their purpose of life is, what their objectives are meant to be, and then the dangerous steps that they take to cover up that pain through substance abuse with alcohol and drugs, through promiscuous lifestyles, through exploring you know, destructive ideologies. It's really, really heartbreaking, subhanAllah. And this goes back to that framework of you know, embracing people's pain as if it is our own, that when people are experiencing this, we may feel shy to present the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
but I want us to ask ourselves a question. If we, someone, if we see someone that is sick and we have medicine, would we be shy to present that medicine? We wouldn't. And that is the frame of mind that we need to come with Then that when we approach the ills of society, Islam is that medicine that society needs. And that is how we need to present it while understanding that they may not logically be in a place to understand what they're saying. But if you try to empathize with their pain and try to provide a different way to approach that pain, they will embrace it because everyone wants to eradicate their pain. And this goes on to the third point, harisun alaykum, that the Prophet ﷺ wants what is best for you. And subhanAllah, I think this characteristic of the Prophet ﷺ is so beautiful and so profound on how going back to the fact that the Prophet ﷺ never took things personally. And I, I want to share like the example of a marriage that in Sahih Bukhari in Kitab al-Nikah, you know, the, the story of how Abdurrahman ibn Auf Radiallahu ta'ala anhu migrated to Medina. He left everything behind. He's paired with Sa'd ibn Rabi'ah. Sa'd ibn Rabi'ah offers him his house, his business, his family. He rejects all of it and says, just show me where the marketplace is. He starts working, saves enough money to get married. And one day the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sees him and he has this yellow stain on his shirt. And the Prophet sallallahu asks him, what is that? And he says, oh, Ya Rasulullah, I got married yesterday. And I love to pause at this moment that I want you to imagine that a close friend of yours, you know, someone that made hijrah with you, basically, and has migrated and is one of your closest companions, you know, he's one of the 10 promised paradise, got married and didn't invite you to the wedding. How would you feel at that time, right? From a modern day context, like this is betrayal. How could you not invite me to the wedding? Yet you see that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam doesn't even flinch, like does not even get bothered by it. He simply asks him, you know, did you give her a dowry? He says, yes, I gave her some gold. And then the Prophet ﷺ gives him nasiha, awle mawla bisha, that make sure you celebrate this wedding and let the people know because weddings aren't meant to be done in secrecy and in private. So the Prophet ﷺ took every opportunity to guide and educate people, even when you can imagine that there's some level of pain involved, right? Like your closest, one of your closest friends gets married and you're not even invited. Like you can imagine that there is that pain yet he still took it as an opportunity to educate his companions. And this is what we need to focus on, is not taking things personally. Yeah. Honestly, like our egos are some of the greatest impediments in the development of our relationships and in the functioning of our societies. And the Prophet ﷺ had mastered the letting go of his personal ego. And as long as it wasn't against the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he let it be. And this is just one example of how the Prophet Wasallam let his ego go and showed what was best for the individual. That have a celebration, make sure you, you paid your dowry and you did things properly. So always wanting good for people. And this is something that we need to embrace as well, that constantly wanting good for people. I know, you know this isn't the place to, to talk about uh, Andrew Tate and the, the chaos that uh, inspired uh, online when he accepted Islam. But it was heartbreaking to see that people genuinely did not want Islam for Andrew Tate. Put all of his issues aside, all of the supposed crimes that he has committed aside. But the fact that you didn't want him to accept Islam, this is counterintuitive to the message of Islam itself, that you want Islam for everyone. You want goodness for everyone, right? Mm -hmm. So this whole concept of you know not wanting Islam for people, we have to get rid of this. That even in the life of the Prophet wasallam, one of the individuals that caused him the greatest amount of pain was, uh, was Wahshi. Yet even when he accepted Islam, the Prophet wasallam celebrated the fact that he had accepted Islam, even though the Prophet wasallam at time would not be able to make eye contact with him or would, not be, would turn away his face from him because the amount of pain that was caused by you know, his assassination of, of Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So all that to say, embracing and uh, inculcating this characteristic of wanting good for everyone. Now, the last part of this ayah is that in relationships, it is inevitable that mistakes will be made, transgressions will take place. How do we respond to it? And the Prophet ﷺ was always forgiving and always just and always merciful. And we have the example of the individual in the Battle of Badr 
that isn't lined up straight. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you know, strikes him, or rather taps him is a more uh, appropriate word, taps him on his stomach to stand up straight. That you know, you're getting ready to engage in war. And this man, he got upset at the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he says, "O Messenger of Allah, I would like my my due right." And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam at that time could have had a variety of responses. Get back in line. We'll deal with this later. Don't you know who I am? I'm the messenger of Allah. Don't you know that there's something more important we're meant to be focused on? But the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam embraced justice as uh, a way of life. And he lifts up his shirt, gives the man his staff, and allows him to strike him back. And it is because of this value of justice that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had that the people loved him even more. And this companion, he kisses the chest of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and lets bygones be bygones. We look at the example of uh, Hatib ibn Abi Balta radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that he was a Badri that participated in the Battle of Badr, yet as the Fatah Makkah was happening, he sends this letter to warn his family members there that the um, Muslim community is, is, is coming. And perhaps they, they will take their land and, you know, they may face some sort of persecution at that time. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in perhaps the most treacherous, you know, example we see in the seerah, like this is treason at its highest level, that this is completely, uh, you know, uh, the antithesis of what a Muslim should have in terms of uh, al-wala and bara, that he goes and he, he sends this letter to warm his family in interests against the what the what what the ummah has yet at that time the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the story of hatib right yeah the story of hatib um the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam looks at his history in the fact that he was there in the battle of badr and you know he was there at a time that was perhaps one of the most difficult moments in the history of islam and he also looked at his reasoning or his intention behind it it wasn't intentional act of treason but rather it was a dunya we think that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw that Hathib wanted. And he forgives Hathib at that time. And Hathib is excused for his transgression based upon his history and based upon a dunya we based intention, a human based weakness. And thus the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is compassionate and merciful towards the believers. So now where we live in a day and age where it's so easy to cut people off and to think that we don't need them and they don't need us and everyone just moves on this was not the character of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he deeply invested in relationships and he found a way to make them work and he found a way to make them work but this all comes together that in order for this to happen number one you have to recognize that people come with all sorts of pain and empathize with them and treat them as if they are in a state of pain you have to desire what is good for those people and bring them benefit to their dunya and more importantly, to their akhirah. And as mistakes are made, you have to be pardoning and forgiving. And I think more appropriate for us that as we pardon and forgive, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pardons and forgives us. As we pardon and forgive, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspires others to pardon and forgive us. Because we're not the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at the end of the day. And we're going to make many, many more mistakes and many you know, sins that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not do. So even for our own benefit, there is great virtue in pardoning and forgiving others. So now, the challenge to this approach, right? We've presented this framework. What are the challenges that you're going to, fra you're going to face in this framework? And this is you know, has a lot to do with our own emotional bandwidth. That oftentimes people are not in a capacity to handle their own problems, right? I have to balance my uh, marital life. I have to balance my career. I have to balance my life as a, as a child to my parents. I have to balance my life, you know, as a, a community leader. Whatever it may be in your situation, there are multiple roles that you have to play. And all of them come with problems. All of them come with things that will expand your emotional bandwidth, meaning you're being pulled in all directions. And what that does is that if you understand emotional bandwidth having its limits, then you understand that if you can barely handle your own problems, how can you deal with the problems of others? And this is why it's so important to have a framework of how to deal with your own problems. And this is where, you know, understanding qadr 
is so important and so imperative, particularly for those engaging in dawah, particularly for those engaging in dawah and learning to understand that sometimes when you put your best foot forward, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has another plan for you, but your reward is written. The hardships that you go through, your sins are being forgiven. Your ranks are being raised. So you develop this own framework for dealing with your own challenges to increase your own bandwidth, to carry the burdens of other people, to carry the burdens of other people. And this is why the Prophet wasallam was so successful in his influence because he had expanded his emotional bandwidth to such a degree that not only could he carry his own burdens, but others that had burdens would naturally offload their burdens on the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is not just restricted to human beings, right? We have the, the famous story of the camel that's being abused, overworked and underwatered. He recognizes something in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even though tens of men walk by this camel all the time. But he recognized something in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that allowed the camel to express his pain to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that he was someone that carried the burdens of others. So now we naturally avoid pain for this reason. Many people shy away from emotional investment in others altogether because we don't want to carry their burdens. We don't want to carry their pain. But if we look at true relationships, as, as cliche as it sounds, but with a friend, you have double amount of the, of the joy and half the amount of sadness because you're able to share these emotions with those people that genuinely want good for you, right? And this is what the Prophet Sallallahu had done. So now from our, from our own perspective, that before you embark upon this um, uh, journey of emotional intelligence, we want to make sure that we ourselves are trying our best to live a balanced life have a good understanding of our aqidah, have a good understanding of who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, have a good understanding of qadr, have a good understanding of the rewards that the believers will get on the day of judgment. And all of this will help us process our own challenges so that when we experience pain and hardship, this does not prevent us from continuously helping others. Because oftentimes when you don't create this capacity for yourself, you're not able to help others. And in order to be able to help others, you have to have created this capacity for yourself first. So you have to recognize the challenge of this approach. And this is like uh, you know, a, a case study that we present from the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where a young man, he comes and asks the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam permission to commit zina. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as others are pushing him away, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells him to come closer. And he asks him, would you like this for your mother? He said, no. Would you like this for your daughter? He said, no. Would you like this for your sister? He says, no. And he said, neither would people like it for their sisters and for their mothers and for their daughters and for their aunts. And for the, then the Prophet wasallam places his hand on this young man's chest and he says, oh Allah, forgive his sins, purify his heart and guard his chastity. And after that, the young man never again inclined uh, towards this particular sin, towards this particular sin. Now, I use this as a case study, and you can use the example of the man that urinated in the masjid. You can use the example of, uh, of, the, of the companion uh, that was addicted to alcohol, right? That twice he's found drinking alcohol, and he's intoxicated, and he's lashed, and a companion curses him. And the Prophet ﷺ forbids that companion from cursing him. And he says that, I know this man to love Allah and his messenger ﷺ. In all of these instances, as society is pushing these people away, the Prophet ﷺ is bringing them closer. And he's winning their allegiance based upon the fact that he's showing genuine love and care. He's providing them benefit by educating them. He's making dua for them. He's showing them the power of touch. Like, I want us to think about this. What was the benefit of the Prophet wasallam touching this man's chest? Right? You can say that, yes, there's a, a spiritual benefit of, of barakah that the Prophet wasallam is sharing with him. But there's something deeper than that, that as human beings, in our most vulnerable moments, we just want to be held. We want to feel loved. We want to feel cared for. And the Prophet wasallam placing his hand on his chest that where this young man, perhaps he felt, I'm impure. 
the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is showing that you are pure and I make dua for you. That may Allah forgive your sins, purify your heart and protect your, your chastity. So all of these points of benefit that we're learning from on how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is able to empathize and with each situation use the approach that is best. Sometimes it is logical. Sometimes it is just merciful and compassionate in his example. And sometimes it's even standing up for the individual, right? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam won with these people's allegiance. And whenever a mistake was made, as in all of these cases, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was always pardoning and forgiving and easygoing with these people. And he saw sincerity in them. He saw sincerity in them. Now, what do relationships actually require? And this is you know, taken from Sheikh Mikhail Smith's book as well. They require sincere empathy. Perceptive emotional understanding and profound emotional investment. So sincere empathy we've spoken about, trying to understand the circumstances that people are coming from, understanding the pain that they're feeling, and that is to better help them and educate them, navigate through that to get to the desired point in the relationship. Perceptive emotional understanding. Now, the difference between emotional awareness and uh, emotional understanding, and this is coming up in a, in, in a future slide, but emotional awareness is simply recognizing a person's state. So oftentimes you may ask someone, how are you doing? And they're like, alhamdulillah, I'm fine. But through their body language, through their tone, through their facial expressions, you're able to see that something is clearly not right. right? So that is what emotional awareness is. You're able to recognize that something isn't right. Emotional understanding is your ability to figure out what is causing them their pain or their whatever emotional state that they're in? Your ability to understand that, that is what emotional understanding is and profound emotional investment. So I want you to think of you know Christian uh, marriages that as the husband and wife are getting married, you know what is the, the priest saying? In, in happiness and in sadness and in, in goodness, uh, in health and in sickness, you know, you choose to stand by them. And this is like when you look at this theological concept of al-wala and al-bara, I think there's a psychological component to this, and there is an emotional component to this, and that is that I will continue to be there for my brother and sister, whether he is a zalim or a mazlum, right? As the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam tells us, unsur akhaka, that you know, support your brother. Or and sister, whether they're a zalim or mazlum, they said, "Oh, Messenger of Allah, we oh, know yeah. how to if help you could, someone." If you could, if you could just translate zalim and mazlum. Yeah, that oh, Messenger of Allah, we know how to help someone that is oppressed, but how do we support someone that is a zalim? How do we support someone that is uh, a zalim? So, as for the one that is oppressed, you help them get out of their oppression. As for the one that is an oppressor, you help them stop their oppression. Right. So this concept of recognizing human flaws, recognizing uh, you know, human weaknesses, recognizing mistakes that are inevitably going to be made by a creation that is weak, that also requires that you stick by them and stand by them, that you advise them and you continue to support them and help them and continue to build themselves. And this is again, you know, subhanAllah, it requires a level of sacrifice from a dunyawi perspective. It requires a level of sacrifice from a dunyawi perspective because if you're so focused on building people's akhiras and connecting them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you know building their, their spiritual resilience, it requires that you sacrifice the luxuries of this world because either you're going to be chasing the luxuries of this world or you commit yourself to this field uh, of da'wah. And this is where, you know, I know this is going to go into a whole other tangent, but if you look at the, the da'wah realm right now, oftentimes we try to balance, you know, a dunyawi success from within the field of da'wah while trying to give da'wah. And that is a field that is, or that is a balance that is next to impossible to strike. Because if we look at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he shows us that if you want to make true impact over a short period of time, it will require sacrificing the dunya. And we've seen you know, examples in this, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is their ultimate judge. But people like Shaykh Abdul Rahman al-Sumayt, rahimahullah ta'ala, that, you know, literally sacrificed whatever he had and 
tens, if not hundreds of thousands of, of people uh, accepted Islam at his hands. So all that, to, to get back to our main point, is that you have to stand by people even in their toughest of moments where they make mistakes and do things that you do not agree with. You have to continue to support them as long as they are sincere. And I can't emphasize this enough, that as soon as people show that their allegiance is not to Allah or to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or to the deen of Islam, there's pretty much nothing that you can do to help these people. But if people show their sincerity to Allah, to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and to the deen of Islam, then no matter how many mistakes they make, as long as they're willing to seek forgiveness from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and to learn and to rectify their ways, we have to stand by these people and help them get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, understanding communication. Oftentimes when we think of communication, we think of it purely as verbal or written communication. But in fact, a lot of communication is through people's body language and through people's facial expressions. So if you look at you know, this graph over here, this shows us that 7% is verbal, 38% is tone and expression, and 55% is facial expression. And facial expression is inclusive of body language as well. And this is why you know, oftentimes we think that I can just send a text message, or you know what, we can send voice messages to one another. But if you're restricting your communication to these modes of communication, you're losing out on the body language and facial expressions, and you're also losing out often on the tone and, and expression. And that is why it's so important that when you need to have a sensitive conversation, make sure that you're emotionally regulated. So give yourself enough time. And then number two, try to do it face to face. And this is where you'll, you know, it'll be a lot more difficult to, to harm an individual or to come across as disingenuous or to, to say something and do something that's a lot easier to do when you're behind a screen, right? Like the simple example is if you look at the level of bullying that takes place in the comment section of a YouTube channel, that's not the same level of bullying that will take place if you're face-to-face -face with that individual, right? People become emboldened behind the screen Whereas in face-to-face, -face, we're required to preserve our dignity uh, to the best degree possible. So all that to say that if you understand communication, understand the fact that very little of it is actually verbal, and it is more about tone and body language as well. And pay very close attention to a person's tone and body language as you're communicating with them, right? We see this and the example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. You know, there's a, a chapter in Sahih al-Bukhari called uh, The Anger of, of, of Women. And I remember the first time uh, I, I taught this class, I'm like, okay, how am I going to teach this uh, portion of the class? It's, it's going to come across as, you know, very chauvinistic, uh, if not misogynistic. But it's the exact opposite. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is showing that women folk need to be allowed to express their emotions to, in, in its full range, from happiness to sadness, from joy to anger to, to whatever the case may be. And the, the, the example we use over here is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was one day with Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, and you need to contextualize this, that they live in a very small hujra. It's a very small apartment that you put your hands out and you're pretty much touching wall to wall. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells her to come closer. So he is creating a moment of intimacy that has no physical touch. And he whispers in her ear, even though there's no one else present, but to create that moment of intimacy, and he whispers in her ear, Oh, Aish, I know when you're angry with me, and I know when you're happy with me. And she says, Oh, Messenger of Allah, how am I when I'm angry with you, and how am I when I'm happy with you? And the Prophet Sallallahu says, when you're angry with me, you say by the Lord of Ibrahim, such and such will happen. By the Lord of Ibrahim, you will do such and such. And when you're happy with me, you say by the Lord of Muhammad, such and such will happen. By the Lord of Muhammad, you will do such and such. Now you can imagine, you know, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she's described as al-Humayra. Her, her, her uh, cheeks were very rosy and they would often become red. You can imagine that this is one of those moments where she's flustered, and you know her her face is is filled with 
with shyness and modesty at that time because she's overwhelmed at the fact that not only is the Prophet wasallam allowing her to fully express her range of emotion, not only does he, you know, recognize the change and shift in emotion, but the Prophet wasallam pays such close attention to her language that he's picked up this habit of her. And here's like perhaps the, the beauty in all of this is that after he's expressed this love without actually saying, you know, I love you in those terms, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she says that, O oh, Messenger of Allah, even though the name may change on my tongue, my love for you always remains in my heart, right? And the beauty over here is, again, as men, we often want the last word. Whether it's in an argument to prove that we are right, or even in expressing love to our family, that there's no way you love me more than I love you, right? We have to, we have to we tell this to our kids, we tell this to our wives, because that is what men supposedly do. But here the Prophet wasallam teaches us something so valuable that he lets her have the last word, that you know she expresses her love in this way, and the Prophet wasallam does not have a need to comment any further. And you just enjoy that moment that you've created between a husband and wife that has no physical touch and is all about communication to one another at the deepest emotional levels. So this is you know, how the Prophet ﷺ understood communication and used communication effectively. Now, outbursts will take place, right? We'll see this from young children that you know they'll start crying from what we see from our perspective is no obvious reason. We see this from adults as well. Things do not go their way. And all of a sudden they're misbehaving, they're cursing, they're abusive. And all of this is happening. And Sheikh Mikhail Smith, he marry, he mentions the story of uh, Androcolis. And there, if you look up the story online, there's no consistency in the, in the, in the story. <laughs> like, you know, this is the beauty of the science of hadith. You can, you know, uh, siphon the, the weak hadith through to the chain of narration. But here, there's no chain of narration. So you have no idea what the authentic version of this story is, subhanAllah. But the summary of this story is that there's a lion that is continuously attacking a village. And he comes and he, you know, just tears everything apart in this village and attacks people and hurts people till the people hide and then the lion disappears. And this slave, Andraculus, you know, he's exiled uh, from his home. His master doesn't want him. Or in another version of the story, he actually runs away. And as he runs away into the jungle, he finds this lion that is just shouting and screaming. And Andraculus, he thinks to himself, you know, if he's shouting and screaming, there must be a reason that he's shouting and screaming. Something must be causing him pain. So he gets closer to the lion and he recognizes that, you know, there's like a thorn in the, in the paw of the lion. And he has everything to fear because this lion has clearly, you know, attacked everyone in the village, subhanAllah. But he gets closer to the lion and is very calm and comes across as very, you know, non-harmful, as non-violent. His hands are up. And he gets closer and he caresses the lion and he asks the lion to lift up its paw and he pulls out of the thorn and the lion embraces him, subhanAllah, and the lion embraces him. So eventually, you know, Andraculus and the lion become very close friends and the lion brings him meat every day from all the food that he, uh, you know, preys upon till Andraculus one day he becomes lonely and he goes back to the village and he goes back to the village and his master catches him and they imprison him and they're about to execute him. And one of the ways of execution is that, you know, they feed the person to the lion. So they had dug this pit and they bring the, they capture the lion. And Andraculus is placed inside this ditch now. And this lion comes out and it was the same lion that he had helped. And rather than attacking him, the lion embraces Andraculus. And, you know, the, the example of a, of a dog, you know, licking its master uh, is given. And the king is surprised. Why did this happen? And it all happened because when everyone else was afraid and everyone else, you know, cared about themselves, Andraculus was the one that cared about the lion and found the source of pain that this lion was feeling. So all of this going back to say that if you look at people's natural behavior and you see what their habits are, you're able to figure out what an outburst is because that outburst is out of place for them. So this can be a moment of anger. This can be a moment of sadness. It can be a moment of anxiety and frustration. It'll manifest itself in different ways. And you consider this as something abnormal. 
And logically, this dictates that if you recognize their normal beha behavioral pattern, when they do have an outburst, there must be a reason behind it. So the emotional awareness is about recognizing the, the, the change in, in behavior, the change in emotion, and the emotional understanding is, can I understand what's causing them this pain? With children, it's very, very simple, right? That perhaps they haven't sleep, slept enough, perhaps they haven't eaten, um, you know, perhaps there's something that's bothering them on the inside. And if you can cater to these needs, more than likely this will solve the, the issues of the child. As we get older and as we develop emotionally and psychologically, those scars and those bruises are you know, less uh, or, or are not as apparent anymore. And they require more of, a, more of a triage to diagnose what's actually going on underneath. But as you understand a relationship, you can sort of figure out what the underlying issues are, what the underlying issues are. And this is, you know, the difference between awareness and understanding that emotional awareness is simply one's ability to see or perceive emotional shifts, whereas emotional understanding is one's ability to understand the forces behind those shifts, what's actually causing them. Now, let's look at pitfalls that people fall into uh, with this lifestyle of emotional intelligence. And I share a series of quotes here that I believe are very valuable to our discussion. The first of them is there is a high price to pay for ignoring our own emotional states. Feelings and desires that have not been acknowledged and examined will continue to haunt us and affect our behavior until we face them and deal with them appropriately. By ignoring our own emotions, we slowly develop a lack of familiarity with ourselves. And this lack of familiarity leads to avoiding moments of inner reflection and contemplation. We feel awkward when we are alone, just as one feels awkward in the presence of a stranger. We have effectively become strangers to, our, to ourselves. And subhanAllah, this is uh, very profound, that if you look at one of the habits that humans have developed in our times, is that they will hold onto their phones as they're falling asleep because they don't want to have to deal with their thoughts and their emotions before they go to sleep. So let me watch enough videos. Let me, you know, scroll through enough social media that I get so tired and so exhausted that I don't have time to process my thoughts and my emotions. Whereas when you look at the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's the exact opposite, that you make your dua before going to sleep. You're supposed to recite Surah Al-Mulk and Surah Al-Sajda and, you know, uh, say SubhanAllah 33 times, Alhamdulillah 33 times, Allahu Akbar 33 times. And this is your cycle for getting ready to, to sleep in this state of submission to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, in this state of peace with yourself. Now, all this going back to say that each and every one of us will grow up with some level of trauma. You know, um, it's, it's very interesting that when you look at the world of trauma, one of the leading experts is Gabor uh, Mate. And he has some, you know, great quality content uh, out there that I think aligns itself with Islam. But then he also goes on like two different extremes. One is the usage of, uh, of like hallucinogens as a, as a form of treatment. And then the other is pretty much defining everything as an act of trauma. That even, you know, a, a child being born is an act of trauma, not only for the mother, but for the child itself. So all of this to say that, look, trauma is a very serious sub uh, subject. And I believe at some point in our lives, everyone will experience trauma. It is just a part of the human experience. But the takeaway over here is you need to learn to deal with your traumas. You need to learn to deal with your hardships and calamities and losses. You need to make sure that they don't paralyze you beyond repair, right? Oftentimes when things are ignored and they're, you know, not diagnosed and there's no troubleshooting done to use, uh, you know, IT language, then it's going to lead to, to greater catastrophes taking place in the future. That our own, you know, shortcomings as children toward, towards our parents will lead to failure uh, for us as parents with our children, right? So navigating through those things and embracing those things is very important. And recognizing that, look, life is going to be filled with hardships. We're just required to try our best and navigate our way through it. That pain within of itself is not negative. But if that pain takes you away from Allah 
and takes you away from doing good deeds, that is when pain actually becomes negative. And you actually have a way to channel it into something positive because when you're feeling pain, the heart naturally wants something more powerful. And that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The heart naturally wants someone that can mend and that can heal. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-Jabbar and al-Shafi, right? So it naturally longs for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in those moments. So you use those moments to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So again, going back to this topic of qadr and dealing with our own issues is very, very important. And if you don't do that, you can forget about helping others, but even just being at peace with yourself can become very, very painful. And this again goes back to societal ills that we are living in a day and age where you know, usage of fentanyl is completely out of control, completely, completely out of control. Like on a daily basis within the Muslim community, we have people overdosing because of this addiction to substance that helps them, you know, mitigate in their experience the pain that they're feeling, the emptiness that they're feeling, the void that they're feeling. So you need to find ways to fill those voids with the appropriate things, starting off with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his worship. And then, you know, pro productive companionship, the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and being a part of a, of a greater community. Number two, we should never be overconfident that the burdens we place on others are within their capacity, simply because they do not say anything. Rather, we must fear Allah regarding those people who cannot speak. And this is particularly for those of us that may be in positions of leadership, and I use this term very loosely, where you could be a parent, you could be a teacher, you could be a, a manager at work. When we assign tasks to people, people may not say anything because they are shy. People may not say anything because they feel embarrassed. People may not say anything because they fear that there will be, they will be reprimanded or there will be consequences to them you know, expressing themselves. So what we need to do over here is go back to that level of empathy and try to empathize with these people that have we empowered these people to do these tasks? Have we provided the tools that these people need to do those tasks? Have we provided the education that people need to do this task? Have we provided an environment that is safe enough that they feel comfortable failing and learning from their mistakes? All of this has to be put in place for these individuals, and particularly with non-Muslims that embrace Islam, oftentimes we're just way too harsh with new Muslims, right? I remember, you know, the 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 Dawah of the 90s, you know, we, we criticize it a lot uh, because of all the mistakes that were made, and perhaps this was one of them, that there was such a heavy focus on the physical elements of Islam, and that physical state of Islam was not up kept with a spiritual development as well, with a tazkiyah development of it as well. So as a person embraces the physical, it becomes more difficult because they haven't even learned how to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yet, and we're throwing all of this upon them. So all of this to say that, you know, starting off with our relationships, going back to those points, have we provided the tools? Have we provided the education? Have we made an environment that's safe enough for them to make mistakes and learn from? And if we haven't done this, we have no right to blame. We have no right to criticize because a leadership, uh, a true leader has to embody those characteristics. And, you know, the, the, the leader success is in the success of, the, uh, of those that is underneath them. So keeping those things in mind that we can never underestimate, or actually we should never overestimate people's capacity, but rather underestimate, provide tools, educate, and create safe spaces. And that is uh, the prophetic methodology. Yeah, and, you know, thank Number. you for bringing up uh, the, you know, the whole issue of converts. Uh, uh, as I'm sure you know very well, Sheikh Naved, you know, uh, you know, there are stats out there showing that, uh, unfortunately, a considerable uh, number of converts to the deen do end up leaving. And uh, you know, the constant feedback, uh, you know, that I get from informed uh, da'is and members of the community is that, unfortunately, a lot of the times we tend to look at converts as, you know, shahada counts, right? Okay, alhamdulillah, we got this, we got this brother to give us shahada. He, he, he got accepted to the deen. Perfect. Who's next? Who's next in line, right? While, you know, here, 
when it comes to our emotional intelligence, we're 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 failing considerably by by considering just how uh you know uh, emotionally difficult it would have been for a, a lot of people to to accept Islam and to leave their old religion and to uh you know that that po- would have possibly led into them getting into some tension with their you know friends and and, and family and that here we need to welcome them into our community in a more holistic sense. A lot of them are spending Eid all by themselves, while we, you know, born and raised Muslims are spending it with our families, for example. So there's definitely a, a considerable improvement required, you know, needed collectively on, you know, on the on the Ummah's part uh, when it comes to emotional intelligence and uh, and and you know and empathizing with, you know. The, the, the difficulty that the, a lot of these converts are, are going through when they come and accept the deen. And, uh, you know, so that's just something I just want to uh, mention. No, Jazakallah khair, Bassam. You know, um, it's a, a sad reality. And, and I think there's like two things to look at, that as many people are accepting Islam, there are just as many people leaving Islam, right? And then number two with these converts, it's not just about them embracing Islam and leaving their old religion. But it's also the societal pressure that they're going to feel. Like people do not realize the stigma that these people feel when they share with others, yeah, I've embraced Islam. And they're like, what? You embrace the religion of the terrorists? Like mm-hmm. that sort of stigma mm-hmm. is so real, right? And and we see this all the time. Uh, and then also from the side of the community that, you know, these people are new to Islam. They don't know much. And you have to basically treat them as, as babies that are coming in and hold their hand step by step until they're able to to, to, to learn to walk for themselves, right? So yeah, there's a, a lot to be done in that space. Allah al-Musta'an. Um, but inshallah, let's continue. Pitfall number three, as actions become more automated, we no longer remain mindful of them. With the loss of mindfulness, there's also a loss of intent and deliberation. And this speaks about intentionality. So you, you can take the example of you know, why is it that people don't leave the salah more spiritually rejuvenated? And that comes down to the fact that we're reciting the same du'as, reciting the same adhkar, reciting the same surahs, doing the actions as quickly as possible, doing no mental preparation in advance of salah, and are constantly engaged with the outside world in the salah. So the result is you leave salah, you know, spiritually drained, as opposed to being spiritually rejuvenated. Now, you apply this to physical relationships where you get into the habit of asking people, how are you doing? Alhamdulillah, I'm doing okay. And then you just move on, right? And there's no deliberate intentionality behind asking, you know, how are you actually doing today, right? Is everything okay? Is there anything that I can help with? Is there anything that I can do for you, right? That intentionality and deliberation. And it's very easy, like, you know, as human beings, we're programmed to to be in automation mode, right? You drive to the same place every single day, and it becomes so easy for you that you don't even have to focus anymore, and your mind will naturally help you navigate there. But the moment you're not going to that destination, you're going somewhere else, your automation will actually lead you astray. And similarly over here, automation, when, you know, it has its benefit to make things easy for us, but the pitfall of it is that you will not notice the change in people's behavior. You'll not notice the the, the change in people's attitudes. You'll not notice the change uh, in the way people talk to you or the level of interactions and how relationships naturally just break down because there's no intentionality behind it. And this goes back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where, you know, when we look at Salatul Jama'ah, you know, the prayer and congregation in the masjid, we get bogged down into the fiqh behind it. Is it obligatory? Is it not obligatory? But I think the social element of it is so important that the way the Prophet Wasallam knew something was wrong was when he didn't see people show up in Jama'ah for several days in a row. That has anyone checked up on this person? Is this person okay? And if you're not creating that sense of community for yourself and you're not a part of that community, how will people ever know when something is wrong? And the same thing for leaders, where if you're not a part of you know, a, a community or not part of an institution where you can regularly interact with people, how will you ever check up on people, right? So this pitfall of automation is something to be very cognizant of as well. 
Now, these are small sunnas that will make a, a big difference. You know, what are things that we can implement in our day-to-day -day lives that will make a huge impact? Number one, smiling. And I think, you know, the intentionality behind this is so important that as you're coming close to someone and you're about to say assalamu alaikum, as you're about to begin a presentation, as you're meeting someone for the first time, a smile goes such a long way in disarming people. And this is what we see from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Number two, shaking hands. And this, again, we look at it from a spiritual standpoint. The longer you're shaking hands, you know, the more sins are, are, are falling from the, from the people that are shaking the hands. But it's also a sign of genuine care that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was always the last to let go. Saying that, you know, I cherish this handshake and I don't want to let you go, but I have to because we have to move on to bigger and better things. But I'm expressing to you that, you know, I genuinely care and love you through this handshake. Speaking slowly, clearly, and regularly repeating. And, you know, this is something that uh, I, I struggle with till this day. Yet, you know, my mind is like moving at a thousand miles an hour and my tongue is trying to keep up. So I do tend to speak very quickly. Um, but again, you know, when you see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he enunciated every single letter and he repeated things and he spoke clearly and succinctly, right? And this is, you know, effective communication where it's at the most basic and easiest of levels that everyone can understand. Yet those that are at a scholarly level, it is so deep, you can, provide, you can extract multiple meanings from it. The importance of expressing gratitude to people. Right, making them feel appreciated. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a shukur. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us that he who has not thanked the people has not thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be the first to apologize. And again, you know, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam telling us that the better of the two uh, parties that are quarreling with another is the first to give salams, right? And this is the equivalent of an apology. And I believe this too goes such a long way, particularly from people in leadership positions. And I need to highlight this that leaders need to exemplify and lead by example in giving apologies. That we can't let our egos get in the way. It will not make you less of a leader. It will not you know, demean you and debase you in the eyes of the people if you recognize a mistake, but it will only increase you in status. Right? Is the, are these not the words of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Man tawada alillah rafa'ahu Allah. Did Allah's messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam not say that whoever humbles themselves for the sake of Allah, that Allah subhanahu wa taala will raise their status? And this is why it's so important to be the first to apologize. The importance of supplicating for others. Simple things as regularly making du'a that Allah makes things easy for them, that Allah you know protects them, that Allah guides them. All of these du'as that we make for one another in people's presence and in people's absence is very, very powerful. Being there for others, right? Like what is the point of a relationship if we can't be there for one another? Why does the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam emphasize that when part of the Ummah is hurting, all of the Ummah is hurting, that we need to be there for one another. And last but not least, the importance of forgiveness. And I know this is uh, a very difficult subject to navigate, but the motivation behind it needs to be for the sake of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. That as I pardon and forgive, Allah will pardon and forgive me. That as I pardon and forgive, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will inspire others to pardon and forgive me because I too have my own share of mistakes and shortcomings towards people, right? This is just a part of the uh, human experience. So trying our best to uh, inculcate, you know, these habits into our day-to-day -day lives will, uh, will make a huge difference, inshallah. And then, you know, I, I, I like sharing this uh, as well. That at the end of the day, sometimes you can try your best and you have to accept the fact that it's not your fault. A plethora of recent studies now suggest that the foundation for emotional capacities like emotional management, emotional flexibility, and emotional understanding is laid primarily in early childhood. Mm. An emotionally unintelligent adult is often the result and victim of emotionally unintelligent parenting methods. But I think let's you know step away from this quote for, for a second. And look at the, the example of Nuh alayhi salam. Nuh alayhi salam's own son did not accept Islam and rather embraced kufr and embraced you know, disbelief. Was this a shortcoming in Nuh alayhi salam as a prophet and messenger? Was this a shortcoming in Nuh alayhi salam as a parent? No, we would never accuse Nuh alayhi salam of this. What this is a result of is at the end of the day, people are going through their own issues and you should not focus on the results, 
but focus on the effort and the sincerity behind it. And as long as you were sincere and you made that effort, if people don't end up accepting Islam, that wasn't in your hands to begin with. If the relationship you're trying to develop doesn't reach the level that you want it to reach, this is just a part of وَجَعَلْنَا بَعْضُكُمْ لِبَعْضٍ فِتْنَةً أَتَصْبِرُونَ That we have created some of you a trial for others. Will you be patient? And that's how you need to embrace it. But always start with, was I sincere and did I try my best? If I did that, leave the results to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I was not sincere and I didn't try my best, then we need to go back and fix those things and correct the mistakes that we've made. Now, the Sheikh's point here is very valid as well, that when people grow up you know, with trauma and with negative experiences that they haven't learned to navigate through, oftentimes those are going to be barriers and hindrances. But that is their issue and not our issue. And this is valid from the Sheikh's perspective as well. These are the resources that I was referring to with the heart in mind uh, by Sheikh Mikhail Smith. And then uh, the presentation that I did that goes uh, and expands on uh, these points uh, much deeper than Allah Ta'ala. It's a four part series on YouTube based on the book called Emotional Intelligence in Islam. And Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala knows best. Jazakumullah Khairan. Yeah, you know, Barakallahu Fikum Sheikh for this, uh, you know, beautiful and uh, important presentation. And I ask Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala to Help us all enhance our emotional intelligence for the betterment of our deen. I mean, um, <clears throat> you know, seeing where you, where you left off, because uh, with with the with the quote from uh, uh, Sheikh Mikail, uh, you know, uh, I did want to ask. Keep uh, you did mention earlier in your presentation that ego definitely does play a role. It does play a role in preventing people from, um, you know improving their emotional intelligence but what other obstacles do you think are preventing people um uh from either becoming emotionally intelligent or slowing their process uh in terms of improving their emotional intelligence and how is that something that could be overcome because you know as, as you know i mean there isn't some on off switch that we could flip we could flick and decide to instantly become emotionally intelligent um there there's going to be have to be some sort of um uh effort that will have to be made um and uh, i did like you know some of the practical tips that you gave uh you know uh, smiling and uh, making dua for others i think these are very practical tips that we could that we could do but when it comes to the actual um willpower to 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 uh become more cognizant of our emotional intelligence state what obstacles are preventing us from from that cognizance and and what do you think we can do to overcome that excellent so the and the first thing that I'll start off with uh I do not proclaim myself as an expert in emotional intelligence it's just uh a field that I'm fascinated and interested in. And uh, anything that I'm saying is not like a holistic advice. It's just based upon the simple research that I've done. So with that disclaimer being presented, I think my own journey with this pointed out uh, a few things. Number one, our approach to knowledge, our approach to Islam, our approach to the Sunnah, right? And it's very fascinating that, you know, when you look at this concept of what is the Sunnah, We'll look at the literal actions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and consider that to be the Sunnah. But one of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala's name is Al-Hakim, meaning that there's a wisdom behind everything that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala legislates. So if that reasoning is not present, then the action in of itself will not be considered Sunnah. So I remember, you know, attending one of the lectures of Shaykh uh, Muhammad Mukhtar Shamqiti, Hafizahullah, in, in Al-Masjid al-Nabwi, and he was speaking about if it is actually Sunnah, to leave the top button of the thobe uh, unbuttoned or not, because that is how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wore it. And I, I can't remember, he shared the story of a student from a country where it got very, very cold 
and he has his button open and he's like shivering and the sheikh's like why aren't you closing your button and he's like yeah you know the, it's a sunnah to leave it open and the sheikh's like no it's not sunnah to leave it open the Prophet did so because he lived in a hot climate and this made him more comfortable in order to protect yourself you need to close your, your top button so all that to say you know I think some of us may come from this mindset that emotional intelligence is a fluffy subject you know as a true man being truly masculine I don't need to understand emotional intelligence. Emotions are, are for, for sissies, for wimps, for simps, you know, whatever language you want to use. But what I wanted to highlight is that throughout my presentation, I tried to present examples from the life of the Prophet Sallallahu while recognizing this is just like 1% of his life. There's still 99% more that you could use examples from his life who was the most masculine of men without a shadow of a doubt to show us that emotional intelligence is a part of uh, human interaction that we need to embrace. Number two is recognizing our own knowledge gaps, right? This whole, you know, knowledge is IQ, that as long as you understand math and physics, we don't need to understand psychology and mental health and all these other social sciences. But again, all of these sciences are complementary to one another. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us, well, فَوْقَ كُلِّ ذِي عِلْمٍ عَلِيمٍ that on top of every knowledgeable person out there, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most knowledgeable, is the source of all knowledge. And there's a reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us these wonderful examples of Allah is more caring and merciful towards his slaves than a mother is towards her child to show us that as we uh, explore Islam and understand what knowledge is, you know, knowledge is very, very vast. There's a spiritual dimension to it. There's a logical dimension to it. And then there's a ta'abudi, a submissive component to it as well. And all of them have to be complementary to one another. So that is a part of the, the knowledge gaps that we have. Number three, I think there hasn't been enough discussion about this in the Muslim community. So as we're growing as a, a community and as a civilization, and we're exploring the Quran and the seerah through different lenses, We'll learn uh, more about these topics from those lenses. Uh, so there, there, there's that as well. Um, and I think more those are some more of the education. More, more education. education. Yeah, yeah. So those are some of the things that that, that I would highlight. Perfect. Um, you know, you, you you did mention how um, the the fact that the Prophet ﷺ himself personally has personally undergone many trials in in his own life. And how that perhaps played a, a very relevant role in, in helping him become more empathetic and sympathetic with people that face trials. Now, alhamdulillah, for many of us, um, we could say that for, for many of us, alhamdulillah, you know, uh, we have not undergone trials anywhere near as close as the Prophet Sallallahu and we ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, you know, to to protect us from these trials at the Ameen. same time. Um, but in this case, how, how how would you advise someone who might not have gone through so many turmoils in his own life to be more sympathetic or empathetic with someone that is going through? A hard time that he perhaps cannot personally relate to. Excellent. You know, subhanAllah, it's, it's very fascinating that when you look at uh, Ibn al Qayyim's book on uh, patience and gratitude, like his framing of, uh, of luxury and comfort and, you know, worldly uh, life is a greater trial than the hardships and calamities that, uh, that people face where they're required to be patient. So I think if people embraced the fact that one of the worst trials that anyone can ever face is hardness of the heart and getting over attached to the dunya, that should be, you know, means enough to be able to empathize with anything else that people go through. And this is just me, you know, um, playing with Ibn al-Qaim's words, rahimahullah ta'ala. So framing of, of, uh, of that is very, very important. Number two, is I think it's inevitable that you've experienced some sort of pain, right? There, there's always pain that, that is experienced. Now, what you do with that pain is always important, right? So number one is remembering that pain, 
that as human beings, we're, we're programmed to forget pain. Now, with regards to empathizing with people, you need to keep remembering that pain, not for the sake of being ungrateful, not for the sake of you know, living uh, of, as a victim, but in order to, to keep your heart soft and to keep your heart relatable to, to the hearts uh, of others. So whatever little pain you have experienced, remembering it and channeling it uh, in, 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 the, in the proper way. And then number three, yes, it's true. You may not have gone through the same level of pain that the Prophet ﷺ went through. But at the end of the day, if you cannot relate to people in their pain, can you find other things to relate to people to with, right? And this is where you can explore a, a variety of things. Some of them are going to be very shallow, like the sports teams that we like, you know, modes of entertainment that we enjoy, but they can go deeper to, you know, the scholars that we like to listen to, the books of that have had an impact on our lives, the the habits that we have that we enjoy, the, the hobbies that we have that we enjoy. You know, you can use those things to develop connection as well. And Allah knows best. Perfect. And you know, Sheikh, what you, uh, I like how you mentioned in the in your presentation that you know, becoming emotionally intelligent doesn't necessarily mean that we're always soft, always gentle. That is the default, you know, uh, rule. But at the end of the day, there will always be red lines. And, and I think sometimes a lot of you know, a lot of Muslims they get concerned that you know becoming kind becoming soft and some sometime be described as naivete in the sense that you know you, if you do that a lot there'll be people out there that will try to take advantage of you and you know and and, and I and I've heard first you know personal anecdotes from from brothers especially in the business world who they're known to be practicing and religious, and there are those that come and try to take advantage of that and say, yeah, akhi, fi sabilillah, give me a 30% discount or something like that, right? Um, and so here, if you, if you wanted to maybe, you know, if you want to assure or, or someone listening to this presentation today that I, I'm sure what you're, you, you know, you, you, is there a way to assure people listening to this presentation that we're not trying to say that you become naive um, and that there's absolutely and let people take advantage of you by becoming soft and kind and uh, uh, and uh, never, you know, becoming firm and 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 and, and harsh even? Uh, what would you say? What would you say to them in terms of how to strike a proper balance uh, in this regard? Excellent. And I think this is something that's very difficult to, to navigate through. And I recognize the challenges that people may face. But let's start off with three simple points. Number one, experience is our best teacher from the perspective of that the believer does not fall into the same hole twice. So yes, sometimes it will be nice to people and people will take advantage of you. But this allows you to learn from your mistake and to not repeat that same mistake, particularly with the same individual. So forgiveness is there in the sense that we don't want them to be held accountable on the day of judgment, but the lesson needs to be learned as well that la darara wa la dirar, that I will not harm you, nor can I allow harm to be done to myself. Number two is understanding the difference between sacrifice and abuse. So what is the key distinction that we're going to make over here? is that sacrifice is something that you willingly let go, whereas abuse is something that you're holding on to and pretty much gets snatched away from you. Very simplistic terms that I'm presenting over here. But the distinction in the eyes of the sharia, man taraka shay'an lillah, awad Allahu ahsana minh, that whoever sacrifices something for the sake of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will replace with something better. So particularly with matters of the dunya, be willing to sacrifice them in exchange for something better from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if there are certain things that you cannot let go of, when someone takes them away from you, go back to point number one. Lesson needs to be learned. Don't allow yourself to be abused. And this is where you need to be patient and show your resilience and leave their affair up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then number three is, again, our perception of what naivety and niceness and masculinity look like. We have to embrace the fact that the Prophet ﷺ defined Islamic masculinity. 
And when you take the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a role model, his default characteristic, as Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala himself defined it, was niceness and gentleness and compassionate and mercy. And as a part of our faith, we do not contend that. We do not contest it. We do not, you know, um, disbelieve in it. But rather we embrace it wholeheartedly. And perhaps our understanding of what masculinity truly is, is distorted and warped, right? So looking at the lens from, uh, looking at the world from an Islamic worldview, as opposed to looking at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from a secular worldview or a liberalized worldview or whatever, you know, the red pill worldview that you may be uh, looking at it, right? That the default is always Islam. Balance is always Islam. And you can't look at another lens and try to apply that to Islam and try to think that it is superior. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, uh, if I if we wanted to, let's say I wanted to self-diagnose myself uh, in terms of you know how I'm performing on you know uh, on the emotional intelligence scale. Are there any signs or indicators that I could be looking at? So I mean, let's say for example, I'm someone who gets along with everyone. Uh, I don't really get into any serious disputes uh, with people um, over, you know, personal matters uh, or any dunyawi matters? Um, can I just deduce from that that hey, I'm, I'm I'm doing pretty good on the emotional intelligence front if I'm not really upsetting people and I'm ha and everyone, you know, I have a good relationship with everyone? Is that a simplistic and justifiable deduction that I can make, or are there some signs to look for? Uh, you know, if we wanted to first like pause and reflect and Kind of diagnose ourselves in terms of how we feel that we're performing uh, on the emotional intelligence front. You know, um, Subhanallah. I, I think in our day and age, the greatest form of tazkia a, a person can be given is what their closest family members say about them. So, you know, do your family members live in fear around you? Are they always walking on eggshells uh, around you, or do they feel comfortable? to be themselves uh, around you and be who they really are in, in front of you, right? So I think that's the first thing that you can look at. Now, let's take it uh, a level further that, you know, we establish what success looks like with the hadith of Amr ibn As. How many people in your life feel that they are the most loved by you, right? If it's only your wife or if it's only your, your child, you know, a lot of work needs to be done. But I also want to emphasize that, look, at the end of the day, you can't use the Prophet wasallam as your level of comparison. You use it as a standard of what you're thriving to and aspiring to, but you can't use it as a standard of comparison because you'll always fall short. So you're destined for failure from that perspective. So we have to be cognizant of that. But how do the other people feel around you? Do they feel loved? Do they feel valued? And so on and so forth. And then number three, as an active exercise, have you tried using, you know, the basic tips that we used of emotional intelligence and that framework of, you know, approaching a relationship from the lens of pain, empathizing with them, giving them what is beneficial, and in the long run, forgiving them and being compassionate and merciful to reach a specific target in the relationship? Like, do you set goals in your relationship that you have actually reached? And oftentimes, I think people don't even look at relationship uh, from that lens of having goals in that relationship, right? So those are, are three things that uh, I would highlight here. Good luck, that was a very good answer. Uh, Sheikh, uh, you know, any final words of advice that you'd like to part our listeners with before we bring this discussion to a close? You know, um, I think the last piece of advice that uh, I would like to share is, number one, for everyone to take upon themselves, to increase themselves in, in knowledge of the Quran and of the Sunnah, right? Um, you know, just uh, on a quick tangent, my last meeting with uh, Sheikh Mashhur Hassan, um, I asked him, you know, what advice do you do you have? And he's like, make sure you have a yearly reading of a tafsir and a yearly reading of Sahih Bukhari and, and Sahih Muslim. And it's very simplistic advice, right? But at the end of the day, you know, this is what will keep you steadfast. This is what, what will keep you growing and learning. Now, which leads me to point number two, is embracing the soft sciences as well. And by the soft sciences, I mean we need practicing grounded Muslims 
in the field of psychology, in the field of sociology, in the field of anthropology, and using their knowledge of the Quran and the Sunnah, as well as tools that they learn from these other sciences to enhance discussion and dialogue within the Muslim community. And I think, you know, exploring emotional intelligence, that's something that's really opened my eyes to that. But again, with that disclaimer, you need to be grounded in your own religion and have knowledge of the, the Quran and the Sunnah and accompany that with other sciences uh, first and foremost, right? Don't just jump into the sciences first and then try to build your uh, spiritual and religious resilience. So those are two things that I would like to share with the audience, inshallah. Thank you for, uh, for that great advice, Sheikh. And Jazakallah uh, khairan once again for this uh, very important uh, presentation. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it, you know, easy for all of us to, uh, uh, you know, implement uh, a lot of the Amen. advice that's been uh, offered to us today. Uh, and with that, I would like to part you and our listeners with the Islamic greetings of Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.